Hey everybody, welcome to the webinar. We are talking about tailoring your supply chain. My name is Kurt Trinka and I'm a former journalist turned fastenaller. I'll be your host today, but first, some housekeeping. Uh, let's do a quick tour of this webinar platform. There is a Q&A feature at the top of your screen. If you have a question for the presenters, uh, that's the place to enter it. The React feature is up there as well. Heart, clap, etc., are all available. So if you hear something that you like, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Also, chat is open, so feel free to jump into there. Uh, with that, dive in. Uh, supply chains are like suits. Uh, you can go with an off-the-rack option if you feel better in something that's custom. That's not going to surprise us. But for that, you need a tailor. So today, we're going to cover inventory management from both the 10,000 foot view and from the shop floor. We're going to dive into why fasteners are a surprisingly good place to look for potential improvements. And we're also going to be looking at ways that you can customize your supply chain to achieve that tailored suit feeling. Uh, let's do some introductions here. Today, I am joined by uh, Joe. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Joseph Galat. This is my 18th year in Fastenal. I'm our director of supply chain covering the Europe, Middle East, Africa territory. Um, spent seven years in the USA, ran a branch, did a whole bunch of different stuff in the organization. Very happy to be here. And Bob? I'm Bob Lund, one of the engineering managers for Fastenal. This is year 23 for me, I believe. Um, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to talking with everyone helping out. Laura, how about for you? Yeah, thank you. My name is Laura Santangelo. I am a channel development manager from Henkel Loctite. I've been with the company for about four years, and before joining Henkel Loctite, I worked in various different manufacturing technologies, uh, ranging from traditional fasteners to additive manufacturing. So very excited to be here and talk about supply chain. Okay, well, thank you, you three, for being here today, and thanks everybody for being on the call and listening. Let's dive in. Joe, I'll start with you. Uh, when we talk about tailoring a supply chain, can you give us some examples of why tailoring is needed in today's environment? Sure. I think the big change that we see in the market is that customers are becoming more demanding and sophisticated. Everybody's looking for a unique experience in their personal lives, and they're starting to expect the same thing from the products and services that they invest in. Um, customers customize their cars, their phones, their clothes, their food and beverages. But I think when you look at industry and really industrial applications of supply chain, it's we're a little bit behind. But that means that there's a lot of opportunity. So at this point, my opinion is it's not just a nice to have, but it's a must. Um, it can create a competitive advantage, loyal customer base, and it can improve and pro improve operational efficiency, which really is where the PL gets impacted the most. So uh, throughout this whole thing, Bob, Laura, Joe, if any of the questions hit your ear right and you want to jump in, go ahead. Bob and Laura, do you have anything you want to add on that? I guess I can jump in from a uh, fastener side of things. Um, <clears throat> we went through a real tough stretch here for the last few years where our engineering team spent most of our time just trying to find fasteners that are close enough that they'll fit and help keep little, help keep our customers lines up and running uh, and it really comes down there to the whole customization concept uh, if people make special fasteners to do exactly what they want them to do you run into the trouble of what happens if we do have issues in the supply chain now? You're the only one that's ordering this. And instead of making 5 million parts at a time, you've tried to talk a manufacturer into making you 20,000 of them. It's pretty tough to get your product. So um, I think we learned a, a really good lesson recently about um, standardizing as much as possible in the fastener world. That's absolutely fascinating to me. I never would have thought that that level of customization could actually bite you. So when we talk about supply chain customization, it's happening at different levels. Bob, uh, let's keep talking about fasteners for a bit here. What's the most overlooked aspect of fasteners that if focused on can yield organizational improvements? Well, I guess I'll continue on the same theme and give it a little background because from an engineering standpoint, we've got 
I don't even know, 75 engineers that work under the fastenal roof, and not a single one of us had a class on fasteners in college. It's just not taught. Uh, and when you go to work, whatever it is that you're making, probably the least sexy thing, if you can talk about fasteners as being sexy, uh, are the nuts and bolts that go into your product. So usually uh, it's the last thing that everyone thinks about. And sometimes you get designed into a corner because you did everything else uh, before looking to see what was readily available from a fastener standpoint. So there are groups out there, ASME, ASTM, DIN, ISO, whether you're in the inch or the metric world, uh, and Fastenal is on basically every fastener standard writing body that is out there. And as an engineering team, our goal is really to help consolidate uh, and, and um, drive people towards using regular off the shelf fasteners whenever possible. And if you need to make some changes, maybe a different plating or coating for uh, extra life, at least you have the body of a basic fastener uh, that you can depend on being there for you. So Kurt, Laura, if, I'm going to, oh, go ahead. Sorry, if I just wanted to add a little bit of context from a supply chain perspective. When we look at the international side of our business, we're going after some of the biggest and best manufacturers in the world. And with that, when we talk about the theme of specialization, if I draw a parallel to the European supply chain, roughly 91% of what we sell in terms of fasteners is unique to one customer, one location. So a lot of emphasis is being put on supply chain modeling and exactly what Bob was saying, it's easy to buy a million pieces of something, but when you need to break in and buy that 10 or 20,000 to keep the production running or build a supply chain with those volumes in mind, there's a lot of emphasis being put on distributors excelling at a modeling aspect that a couple of years ago would have been very difficult to do without some of the technology that we're deploying to allow us to be successful. And just to talk numbers there uh, a little bit more, in the cold heading world, which is how you make most fasteners, uh, a screw that might be a number 10 or a quarter inch in diameter, you can make two or 300 of those in a minute. So we've got a lot of customers that think we're pretty important. We're a big shot in our industry. Uh, we're going to buy 50,000 of these fasteners and, and uh, we can kind of design our own because we're at that level. Well, the reality of that is it takes four to six hours to set up a machine to, to make those fasteners, uh, but yet you're making them at 15 or 20,000 pieces in an hour. Uh, so nobody thinks you're a big shot when you're ordering two hours worth of product from them. So you need to be in the General Motors world or is some some really big manufacturers before uh, they'll stop the presses and work for you. So if you're ordering 50,000 pieces in a year, you're kind of stuck behind the big drivers in our industry. And if you've created a special fastener, you're you're in a bad spot. Interesting. Um, Okay, now I'm going to jump over to you, Laura. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews with uh, procurement, crib, and floor managers, and often their goals are the same. They're looking to see how they can save time and boost productivity. Now, I always see Loctite products in our vending machines, so I know that putting the inventory at the point of use is part of the solution, but what can Loctite do to help customize a supply chain? Wow, that's a great question. Thanks so much, Kurt. So I'm going to tie this into kind of what Joe and Bob were talking about earlier, too. Um, in the world of fastening, you get into a lot of these one-off areas. And as they were talking about, when you're not scaling very high, it's really difficult to source those things. So Loctite kind of comes in in this unique opportunity. And I love that you mentioned the fastenal vending machines because they're really they're a really great asset for both of our customers. Because what they do is they allow us a hands-on approach to build a solution that makes sense for the customer. So what we do when we, in these scenarios, and we're really focused on, you know, breaking supply chain resilience or making their supply chain stronger, what we really focus on is actually using an adhesive to replace some of these traditional fasteners or welding technologies that may have been used in the past. Um, this works really well for a variety of reasons, right? First and foremost, it helps keep labor costs low and it helps keep machines running. So instead of having a welder on staff, you have a vending machine that you can dispense a bottle of instant adhesive and get your machine back up with a very limited cost. 
This also helps our customers with liability because we're working with you guys to jointly manage the inventory, right? So that burden has now been taken off the customer where they don't need to stock a significant amount of adhesive to ensure that their product is already is there because Fastenal is doing that work for them. And you know, it's a win-win for everybody because we get to understand what our customers are doing and their pain points better, and the end users get to reap operational and financial benefits. So really, when we talk about customizing supply chain from a Loctite perspective, it's all about determining the solutions that work for you and where we could take a traditional technology and replace it with an adhesive for lower cost. Okay. That's an interesting way to tie all of that together. I think this is a natural jumping off point, so let's see if I'm right or not. Uh, Joe, I think this one's best for you, but as we've been doing, Bob and Laura, feel free to jump in. Uh, Joe, how can people assess their current supply chain and then identify areas that they want to improve in? I love this question. Anytime you're looking at making a change, you're up against the threshold of, I don't know what I don't know. Fastenal's positioned ourselves to provide this as a value add service. So we have fabulous Lean Six Sigma teams. We call this our um, Lean Group. We have solutions teams that focus on integrated vending machines, which we talked about, Kanbans, RFIDs, various other technologies. Let us come in and perform what's called the TCOA. We have enough insight into truly how the best manufacturers in the world operate. Let us come in. We'll do what's called a gap analysis. We'll compare how you're doing business, what we see today versus the opportunities that we can surface. And then let's work together towards a strategic partnership. There's a lot of discussions, I think, internally, at least on our part of the world, where we're talking about transactional versus strategic integration. Transactional is I'm just going to buy something off of a web shop, cheap price wins. Strategic is more of a partnership, and that's really where we're aligning our sales teams, our specialists, and our, our go-to-market philosophy. We want to help you succeed. If we can grow together, then that's better for both of us. And I think mutual wins and understanding that it doesn't need to be a zero sum game. Someone doesn't have to lose for us to win. We can win together and we can raise the tide for all boats. So in general, let us come in, let us do what we do best. Let us prove to you and validate what we can do. And let's make a decision together, hopefully towards the partnership and strategic side rather than transactional, no value add service. So I think it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it before we were talking about how one piece price could be something that you'd focus on, but all three of you have been talking about how working in concert, you actually might be able to find better savings, it sounds like. So kind of with that in mind, Laura, I think this one goes to you specifically. Uh, well, it has to. How can Loctite improve the performance and lifespan of equipment? Well, uh, first and foremost, you really hit the nail on the head of what our actual objective is at our end customers. We want to help them reduce downtime and extend their equipment life cycle. That's what we're all about. Um, and I think it's interesting, Joe was actually talking about strategic partnerships. And one of the way that we improve the performance and lifespan machine of your machines and equipment is by working with your Fastenal rep and the Loctite rep for what we call on-site activities. So we help you improve your lifespan by, you know, we'll walk through your plant and we'll do an air leak survey and determine how much air you're losing, how much money that's gonna cost you and what the cost of the Loctite solution would be. So you can really easily quantify that. We also do things like in-plant surveys where we're walking your line and seeing, hey, does this fastener come loose? How frequently are you replacing it? So we're really also taking that that value add approach. We're not coming in and just saying, hey, here's a bunch of adhesives. We're coming in from a perspective where we're really trying to understand the shortcomings of the current process and how Loctite can amplify that and keep their equipment running even longer. And of course, with such a broad portfolio, we have a variety of products to serve different industries. For example, if you're in a mining industry and you're really concerned about your equipment life, we can talk about wearing compounds. Um, we can talk about a variety of different solutions for industries, but the first part in extending you know, your life cycle is that partnership. Letting us walk in with your Fastenal rep, as Joe was saying, and understand what you're working with, because then we can help you improve your 
your life cycle and your your downtime. Okay. So I think uh, a lot of people are thinking some version of this question, Bob, but uh, how can making changes to your fasteners affect your entire supply chain? So I'm going to piggyback on what Laura just said. The uh, the thing that our engineering team looks at most when we go out and do a total cost of ownership when we walk the assembly line is is time. Um, fasteners are cheap and they're easy and as I talked about earlier, not very sexy. And because uh, uh, engineers haven't had a background in them, uh, we get an awful lot of well, this is the way we've already done it. You know, it's it's set up. We've we've done it this way for the last 20 years, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way to do what you're doing. And I can't tell you how many times I see people take a, a plate of sheet metal that goes on their equipment and they'll put 12 screws in uh, and make sure that that piece of uh, uh, sheet metal sticks where it's supposed to stick. And those screws are really cheap. They're pennies. But when you look at the amount of time it takes to do the fastening, uh, it, it takes a couple of minutes. And if you're using fasteners that cost dimes, but take a couple of minutes, you're better off using a fastener that costs a quarter, but can take 10 seconds to assemble as opposed to the minute. So that's where we learn to uh, kind of lean on our, our partners like Loctite and say, is there an adhesive way that we can do this? And I, I don't want to um, specifically call out uh, just Loctite stuff, but there's a tape, there's an adhesive, there's a there's another option that you could be using. And um, it, let's look at that. And it's really hard uh, to get some customers to even think about switching because, boy, that's what we feel comfortable with. But when you start looking at the costs associated, many times your fully burdened labor rate is uh, is $100 an hour. And if I can save you two or three minutes, uh, every time one of your air conditioners or whatever runs down the line, it turns out to be a huge number uh, by reevaluating how you're choosing uh, to do your fastening. I think that's a common theme that we keep running into, speed and the idea that total cost is something that needs to be focused on in the modern era. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe, this one I think has to go straight to you. We've delved into some of the customization that's out there to help a supply chain, but where should people start first? This, I'm going to piggyback on some of the things I've said before. Um, when we present our service offering into the market, those are all just tools and options that we have at our disposal. The expectation is if we're going to be successful, you need to let us come in and, and provide this analysis. Let us come in with our lean teams. We'll do a Six Sigma style review. We'll define all the opportunities and we'll put together the best suite of fastenal technology that we can. We'll bring in the best vendors like a Loctite or any other ca category that we're focusing on. Um, I think it's misleading if someone thinks of us as just Class C parts. Certainly that's an important production component, but when you look at our safety sales teams, when you look at our application engineers, not just on fasteners, but in general, how a product is being manufactured, you need to let us come in and not offer you something cookie cutter, but something specialized for you. When I look at some of the best manufacturers I've ever dealt with, there is one production plant not far from where I live. They make 17 models of reciprocating compressors and it's 94 total SKUs. From an engineering up standpoint, they've come in, they worked with our engineers about a decade ago. We harmonized all of the portfolio and now every new iteration of a new model, choose from these fasteners. And that streamlines and adds so much efficiency into the installation. Even if we're talking in this particular case, it's torque installation tools. Well, if I have to change out a bit and recalibrate my tool every time I had change a fastener, these things are devastating to the efficiency of production. We know how to surface this. We're more than capable to present the information in such a way that it's understood. And that total cost of ownership discussion is one that we'd love to, to entertain. So the easy answer is let us come in and do our job. And let me jump on that for just a second. Um, let's also look at the things that your people are having problems with. Are people having carpal tunnel issues? Are you having warranty issues? You know, tell us what hurts. And uh, just like going to the doctor, we're here to really hopefully help what hurts. We used to call that find the snake bite. 
you got to find the, the snake bite so you can help solve it. Yeah. So, Bob, you kind of, I think, started down this path, but how can people get the most out of their fasteners? Really just the same thing. Our engineering team, our lean teams are really here to, uh, as exciting as it seems, we know fasteners better than our customers do. That's our job. Uh, so the ability to come in and look and see what you're doing and how you're doing it, uh, what your pain points are, what your snake bites are, uh, and, and then come to you with suggestions for uh, ways to do things um, it is really the best place to start. Little things like split lock washers. If you're using a grade eight bolt and a split lock washer, the split lock washer is doing probably more harm than good, but it certainly isn't helping. Uh, and it's nice where we can show up and say, hey, would you like to spend less money with us? We'll throw all those away. They're not helping you. Let's, uh, let's start working on what can help you. And sometimes there's an inherent buy-in that you get with a customer when you start showing them ways to spend less money with us uh, and there's more of a relationship built a trust that happens and uh, and then you start seeing more solutions come to the front so laura i have the same question more or less for you we're on a roll here uh, how can people get started with loctite who should they be reaching out to um, well, like Joe said, the first start of us actually having a successful partnership is letting us come in and do the job. So where do you start? Actually, you start with Fastenal. Um, here at Loctite, we are, we're really big on working with strategic partners. So we want you to start with your contacts at Fastenal. Ask them about Loctite on-site activities. Ask them about an air leak survey or conducting an implant seminar because these are the things that are going to help us come in and identify those pain points to get you documented cost savings to make sure your equipment is up and running. Um, that's what we do here at Loctite. We love machines and we want to keep them running. So first start should be your expert at Fastenal. We have reached the end of our prepared comments. We are switching over to Q&A. If anybody out there still wants to submit something, let me know. Uh, I will be reading them off as we go here. Um, I have one saying here that uh, I'm an influencer in my organization and not a decision maker. What are some ways or resources you have that I can use to help advocate for tailoring the supply chain to my own team? Anybody want to take that one first? I'm happy to jump in, I guess. Um, a lot of times when I'm in a sales process, whoever is the contact that we're working with, typically, hopefully not a direct part purchaser. I think the compensation schedule and, and the validation, the KPIs that are in place for a purchase, there's a lot of per piece price reduction. In a lot of cases, we need to get beyond that discussion. There's a strong case to be made that we validated with thousands of customers with tens of thousands of products that when you invest in your production capabilities and you maximize the consumables that you're using to really be the best, there's huge, huge efficiency gains. So my question to a health and safety manager perhaps might be, what makes you look good to your boss? And typically the same things that we're trying to bring into an organization as a best practice or as a new technology like a Loctite that can do something different than what was available 10 years ago. A lot of it has to do with dealing with the people that understand the total cost of ownership, have a direct line of sight to people that are willing to have these discussions that can be line production leaders, um, general managers, managing directors of facilities. Um, the consultation's free, <laughs> so we can. Uh, there's no upfront investment inst outside of the time that that needs to take place for allow us to really collect the information, data dive, and, and present back to you. But I'd say when we look at the march towards Industry 4.0 and some of these things and technologies, robotics, all these things that need to be deployed, everybody sees it coming on the horizon. You got to start somewhere, and in my opinion, allowing us to engage is a very low risk way to do that. If you don't like what we have to say, there's there's nothing holding you to us. But I think in most cases where we get the opportunity, people are very pleasantly surprised. 
And I want to add on something I would say that's maybe specific to Loctite that kind of follows along with that. You know, when we talk about it's the business case at the end of the day, why should you switch? It's it's a business case. And we do something at Loctite. It's called the documented cost savings process. And basically what we would do is we'd identify a common point of failure. Um, perhaps it's a retaining gasket that frequently fails. Um, and what we would do is we would identify, we'd talk to your team, how frequently is this failing? We can actually calculate how much money your organization is losing based on those failures. And if we were to implement a Loctite solution, how much money you'd be saving. So if you're an influencer in an organization, but not a direct decision maker, and you can show that business case, I mean, how do you really say no to something? Your, your machines are still going to be running and you're going to be spending less money. It's what every organization is looking for. I really like those. And I think that there's a tie back when you talk about piece price to what both you, Laura, and Bob were saying earlier. The idea that if you focus on the price of one fastener and you don't look at everything in concert, the way that that all comes together is going to save you more money than saving a couple of, I don't know what you want to call, call it, like a, a nickel, like Bob said. That's not the right way to approach it. So some combination of that is probably how you want to be approaching your team. Another one here is, uh, how have COVID and the war in Ukraine, Russia steel sanctions, changed the global supply chain? And how are how can we bring our customers added value in regards to those changes? Is that uh, a Joe one? Hi, Joe. I just got two more gray hairs reading the question. Um, I, I'm in Europe, so a lot of the Russian sanctions specifically, or most recently the Suez Canal crisis off the coast of Yemen, all these things have been hitting us really, really hard. And I, I think a lot of the discussions shifted, especially since COVID, towards supply chain resiliency. I hear that as the new buzzword going around everywhere, but there's a lot of substance to it, I think, from Fastenal's perspective. Um, we have several initiatives. I think like many other companies, when we look at our production parts, we've leveraged economies of scale and we've gone far east for the past 10, 20 years. And now there's more discussions in the past probably year than ever in my career that, hey, let's look at bringing production back closer, near shoring, friend shoring, whatever you want to call it. But with the innate focus on let's shorten the supply chain, not just where the production takes place, but where do the raw materials come from? And Russian sanctions are a great example of this. For those unaware, there is now, in order to import into the UK or to the European Union, you need to be able to prove that the smelt, the raw material that made that bolt, is not from Chinese, uh, from Russian steel, excuse me. So this has even forced us to review our processes for country of origins all the way through to material test certificates with additional requirements that didn't used to exist. So. As complexity happens, and I think we start to shift a little bit back towards globalization, we're positioning ourselves to be able to regionalize some of the production areas of our supply chain. So Suez so Canal gets blocked by a ship on a freak accident, that's okay, we have a factory in Brazil that can make the same thing. So we're looking at it instead of just globalization towards the Far East, we are truly globally sourcing and investing in our future to make sure that the ship the supply chains are the shortest they can be in order to prevent some of these stockouts and production line stoppages that we saw during COVID. That was devastating for everybody. And I would care not to repeat it if at all possible. I bet, I bet. Um, anybody have anything to add on that one? Laura, Bob, I'm gonna guess that's not. Oh, Bob, go ahead. I guess I can. Uh, to piggyback a little bit, that's one of the reasons Fastenal is set up the way we are. We we don't use UPS and FedEx much. We've got our own line of trucks that uh, get from here to there every day so that you get parts. Uh, we don't use outside labs much. We've created our own labs so that we can test our own parts. We have seven machine shops, cold heading facilities around the world so that uh, we can make parts ourselves if we have uh, issues elsewhere and we're looking to expand that greatly uh, so that Fastenal can keep our hands in as much of that process as possible uh, so that if there are issues uh, at any one step along the way, hopefully we have uh, answers for our customers. So Laura, do you I have anything to add? Because if not, I'd, I'd like to add just one more point. No, go for it, Joe. I am so thankful as an organization that we have such good supply chain partners. 
the Loctites of the world, the Ansels in our hand protection category, we've developed 20, 30 year partnerships. So even looking at COVID when all of the allocations and limits and all of this was being put in place, we got a lot of preferential treatment. We were able to deliver for our customers because of what we had done in the previous 20 years plus. So one thing I would not caution everybody, but have everybody be aware. Sometimes when you're chasing the cheapest per piece price, from a no-name brand or somebody that's barely keeping it together when things are good it's fine but when things go bad that's when you have to be able to lean into your partnerships and work together to solve an issue for the customer for the end user that has to be at the core of every discussion and i just want to reiterate i'm so thankful that we have such strong partnerships with so many suppliers I know for a fact that this next one is not for any of you because it must be a plant. It actually says, Kurt, are there any case studies or articles that might be good for me to read up on to learn more about this tailoring your supply chain concept? Uh, yes, uh, of course there are. Um, I think that you want to start with the Curtis Wright one. You can go to our YouTube page and search for Curtis Wright. It's one of the very first videos that you'll see. Um, they actually, there's a quote in the story where one of the people literally says that Fastenal tailored the solutions to our supply chain. So there's your answer right there. Thank you, uh, whoever put that in there. I appreciate that. Let's see, I got to update the field. I wasn't paying enough attention. I'm sorry. Good thing your mom was watching. It right. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are the key factors that influence your supply strategy and design? Joe, is that for you again? Can be. Really depends on the customer, depends on the category of product that we're managing, and depends on really what is the customer's appetite for investment into their facility. Um, I speak a lot about, especially to our younger teams, that there's three ways to maximize your profit opportunity. You can sell your end product for more, good luck. You can source your raw materials better. Everyone's trying to do that forever. You can drive operational efficiency. And certainly when we look at delivering a product and a service at a competitive level, we're talking about the total cost of ownership over and over again. But really what we're talking about is making sure that whatever is expected of us, even beyond the expectations that the customer may have in their mind when we start discussions, we want to be able to deliver at a very high level. And that can be a mix of standard branches. You can walk in and see us in some locations. We can go together from our strategic account stores or even the on-site model where it's total integration where phys Fastenal is physically present, like in the Curtis Wright example. And when we start to get into those arenas, I would encourage what Kurt was saying, everybody watch that video, it's amazing. There's one particular tooling component in there that we're even tracking how many times it's used because we know what is the expected life cycle and we have a whole replacement and resharpening program. So we're not just throwing the tool away and selling you a new one, we're putting it on a CNC machine, getting it back to factory edges and redeploying it into the organization. So. The more communicative and the better the relationship with the end user, the more of the fast and all capabilities can be deployed into that opportunity. Bob, Laura, anything to add? You know, I think one big thing for me, especially when we talk about, you know, influencing your supply chain design and strategy, I'm speaking more from a supplier's per perspective trust and transparency um i come from the supplier side right so i'm i'm working with the fastenals of the world to try to get you guys product and i think one thing that from a supplier side that tends to be missed is being just really pragmatic and upfront about the things you can do and that you can't do. It's a very difficult discussion to have. It's one that I never like doing. But when we're talking about supply chain, when we're talking about keeping these customers up and running, having the difficult conversation is the best path forward sometimes because we want expectations to be aligned. We want you to know what we can do and can achieve, but we also have to understand there's a limit to what we can do. And we want to be very clear with those expectations so nobody is hurt at the end when things don't go according to plan. So when I when I think about supply chain design and strategy as a supplier, I'm always leading with trust and transparency. I need my supply I need my partners to trust that I'm going to do what I am saying and I need them to know that when I say something I mean it. That's a really big part from a supplier standpoint as well. 
Well, thank you, everybody. We are done with the questions. We are done with the presentation. We appreciate you being here today. Uh, we talked about adding technology to get more visibility in your supply chain. We talked about doing an analysis of your TCO to see uh, where you might want to start doing some specific tailoring. And we talked about fasteners, adhesives. Uh, those are great places to look for improvements. So please feel free to reach out later with questions if you think of any and uh, look for an email with the recording so that you can relive this in all its glory. Uh, take care all. Thanks again.